Welcome back in to the B-Sides of Sports, Season 2, Episode 10. I'm your host, Wilson Wong, along- alongside my co-host, Drake Howard, and today we're talking all things NBA Finals, where we have the number one seed out of the West, Denver Nuggets, facing off with the number eight seed, Miami Heat, out of the East. Drake, a lot of things we could talk about with this series. Start us off with your biggest takeaway. I think my biggest takeaway is... The again, I, I usually look for matchups because at the end of the day, I think as much as coaching matters as well as depth, um, stars have to come to play in the finals. I think we th- it's some of the most famous performances in the last few years have been, and so I'm looking at Jimmy Butler and Jokic, obviously. Now, the difference between Jimmy Butler and Jokic is I don't think the Heat have an answer to Jokic, but I don't know if that's going to hurt them as much as if the Nuggets didn't have a response to Jimmy Butler. And that's because Nikola Jokic is pretty consistent 30-10-10 in these playoffs in losses and wins. And it's interesting. I I talked to – we didn't do a pod uh, when we were talking about it, but I brought up Wilson how I think sometimes his stats feel empty, similar to a lot of uh, players who play this style, right, felt. Oscar Robertson, Russell Westbrook, where you look at their stats and career success didn't necessarily follow. And I feel like – that inherently has been one of Jokic's issues as well is his numbers always seem to get there. He gets his numbers, right? And I don't, I'm sorry. I know that everyone always makes the argument his value, his rebounds were more valuable than Westbrook's. I think that's stupid. A rebound's a rebound. So kind of, I think Jokic is going to ball out. If the Nuggets win this, he's without a doubt the MVP. I don't think anyone's disputing that. And I think easily they can win because, like I said, he's just automatic with this, especially this playoffs. In prior playoffs, he struggled a little bit more, but he's almost can't be denied. He's averaging, I think it's 30, 12, and 10, which is just absurd. Now, Jimmy Butler, on the other hand, has had a Herculean effort just to get the heat this far. Noticeably gassed his three losses against the Celtics, just noticeably was off and a little bit gimpy in that last game even. Uh, hurt his ankle late in the fourth and, or late in the third, excuse me. And you can just kind of tell that it's exhaustion. I mean, he's been really carrying this team, especially with Tyler Hero out. He's not an offensive, you know, like sort of um, automatic bucket getter like I think of a lot of other guys. Tyler Hero, that's kind of his whole thing. Jimmy Butler does it all for his team. He's the leader. He plays defense as well as score. So it's not as easy for him to just go out there and score more because he has so many other jobs, And but he can't slack up off on defense either as well as leadership. He's very important in both those regards. So I think that inherently puts him at an advantage due to his exhaustion as well as Jokic now having a week's worth of rest because of sweeping the Lakers as well as so here's a little fun uh, stat I found I was doing some deep diving on advanced stats um, just to see if I could find anything fun that I hadn't heard you know like Nikolai Jokic being the best defensive player of all time or some other you know weird random stat that people will find as justification for whatever they think and now it's a small sample size I will say but over the last three seasons when uh, Aaron Gordon is Guarding Jimmy Butler, he's allowing under 40% field goal percentage and only averaging 12 points a game. Now, it's a small uh, sample size at only 158 possessions, but I still think that's interesting, and I've always been fond of Aaron Gordon. I think he was arguably, again, if he had a few more stats, I think he could have been an all-star this year, really just having a a fantastic year uh, by my standard. So I just think that's interesting. So whereas I said I don't think that he have an answer, I, who's going to guard Jokic? Zeller? Bam Adebayo? I, I just don't think either of them can match up with it. I think the Nuggets realistically have a lot more of an answer. So unless Tyler Hero comes back and he is cleared for basketball activities, guns a blazing, I just see this as a, you know, the star power leans Denver and the depth leads Denver. I think the only thing the Heat really have over him is coaching. Absolutely. That's uh, not a bad take at all. And I think if you look at the ESPN analytics matchup predictor, of the odds are going towards the Nuggets, only 22% towards the Heat. Multitude of reasons for that. You outlaid a lot of that. And I think we can even just start with, there's a reason the Heat are the 8th seed, and there's a reason the Nuggets are the 1 seed. The Heat had a really turbulent regular season, lots of injuries, a lot of players in and out of that lineup. And again, on paper, Denver's just a much more talented team. Jokic is playing at a best in the league, best in the world type talent this past year. And Jimmy Butler, for as good as he has been in this postseason, we kind of saw him really struggle in the latter half of that series against Boston, even last night in the closeout game. You know, he wasn't super efficient. Um, But with that all being said, I'm going to go against the grain a little bit here, and I'm going to choose the Miami Heat. And I have a multitude of reasons for it. 
I'm going to start with just a recent history of the Miami Heat. And if we look to this pairing between Jimmy Butler and Eric Spolstra, started the year of the bubble. And we know that year they made it all the way to the finals. We saw the emergence of Bam Adebayo. Tyler Hero was playing at a great level. And we really saw the emergence of the pairing of Jimmy Butler and Heat culture. Just the things that Jimmy is able to pull out of that Heat roster just by being the leader that he is, demanding the level of excellence that Pat Riley and that Heat organization ask of just the Heat organization as a whole. You know, that's something that people make a big deal about, but I think for good reason. And so if we fast forward to the next year, Miami obviously struggled a bit that year, had a little bit of a down year, and a lot of that was the regression of Bam. Jimmy kind of was playing at an all-star level, not maybe an all-NBA level. But then last year, we see the Heat make it all the way back to the Eastern Conference Finals and come within one Jimmy Butler shot of making it to the Finals in a series where, while I still would have picked Golden State to win, I really would have liked Miami's odds of just extending that series and playing Golden State really tight. And then we come to this year, Miami's the seven seed heading into the postseason. They surprisingly lose that post that first play-in game. And much to my surprise, I did not expect Miami to lose that one. I thought that Jimmy Butler would flip that switch. And I had said before the series, I liked Jimmy Butler in the Heat in a 7-2 matchup with the Celtics. Then we got the 8-1. And, you know, since then, Miami's done nothing but defy the odds. They defeat the Bucks. They go on to beat... Um, the Knicks rather handily, and then we saw, you know, the turbulent series they had against the Celtics, but I think when you look at that four-year sample size, we really see that Jimmy Butler is the player that people have made him out to be in the postseason, and Eric Spolstra is by far and away the best coach in the NBA, especially through these latter rounds of the postseason. It's just the advantage that he's been able to give his team night in and night out has been incredible, and so for those reasons, I really like the Heat. I also like that they might be getting back Tyler Hero, even if it's later on in the series. I just think the relief that he'll offer some of that offense, just as a three-level score, his ability to get to the line, score in the mid-range, as well as drive to the drive to the hole, as well as shoot from the outside. Even if Tyler Hero isn't quite 100%, I just think he adds another element to that offense that they've really been lacking as of recent. Um, I think you've touched on, maybe this was before the pod, but the Miami offense was horrific during the regular season, and we can talk about the injuries, we can talk about the players in and out of the lineup, but the truth is, in the postseason, They've been very reliant on Jimmy Butler, knowing that Adebayo can't be consistent night in and night out. And I think Hero kind of being introduced as a third scorer, we've seen that Caleb Martin has really stepped up into that secondary scorer role. I really like the element of surprise that that can provide Miami. It goes against, you know, the odds and what's, what it would, the matchup would appear on paper, but I'm going to pick Miami here. Yeah, no, and I think, like I said, I think if you make it to the finals, I think it's fair to say either team can win. I've, I've never been one who thinks... Any championship in almost any sport has ever been truly one-sided. I just think going into a matchup, it's impossible to tell. And I think, uh, I'll check, I'm pretty sure coming into it, the Nuggets game one are an eight and a half point favorite. So a pretty convincing, almost double digit spread um, opening. And like you said, ESPN Analytics has it. That's pretty much a landslide that a Nugget consensus. And I think that's fair. Nikola Jokic is the best player in this series. I think Jimmy Butler is the better playoff player. But as a player as a whole, Nikola Jokic is definitely the best player in this series. And what we've seen in is usually if the best player doesn't have the best team, it's usually about a wash. But when the best player has the best team, that's when, to me, it's a hard sell, right? It's one of the reasons Kobe and Shaq were so dominant, in my opinion. You have two guys who won championships without the other guy. So both proved that it wasn't just the other one being complimentary. Now, I'm not comparing anyone on the Nuggets to Kobe or Shaq, uh, but I'm just saying Nikola Jokic is, without a doubt, the best player on the court, and he has a great team around him. So I, to me, that's just what kind of puts the nail in the coffin for this series. Uh, if Jimmy Butler had a little more help, maybe Tyler Hero was healthy, I think this would be way more of a, a wash in my mind and more of a close matchup because I do compare playoff Jimmy to what Jokic is playing like right now. But Nikolai Jokic with Jamal Murray really just coming on in that last series and, and getting into his own, as I already said, I'm a big fan of uh, Aaron Gordon. I just think he's a fantastic player. Uh, Michael Porter Jr., absurd shot creator. And I mean, I'll stop there, but I could keep going and going. KCP, uh, there's just so many guys on that roster that when I'm looking at them, like they have the best player on the court this next series and all of these guys around him. And I'm not saying the Miami Heat roster isn't that. I think, though, they're inflated a little bit due to fantastic coaching and leadership through Eric Spolstra and Jimmy Butler. That's a good point. And if we kind of dive into these rosters a little deeper, 
a lot is made about playoff depth. And I think if you look at the Nuggets, they really have seven really solid players. They've got their starting five and then Jeff Green and Bruce Brown off the bench. And that's about as good of a seven-man lineup as you're going to have in the NBA. When we look at the Heat, they also play about seven or eight deep. Duncan Robinson, Kyle Lowry, Caleb Martin kind of off their bench. And to me, that's where the first tactical advantage lies for Miami. I really like the guard play they've been getting recently. You've got guys like Gabe Vincent, Max Strews, Duncan Robinson, all these guys can shoot, they're quick, and that to me is the one point of attack that they can expose with the, the Nuggets. The Nuggets have not been good defensively all year. We know that in large part because they have to play three neutral defenders, right? You'd probably call Michael Porter Jr. and Murray negative defenders and Jokic is a push. I think he does offer some good things at the rim, but out on the perimeter, you kind of just are leaving him out to dry. And because of that, I really like what Miami's going to do be able to do from a guard perspective especially because we know that Miami's a good three-point shooting team and while they've been up and down across the regular season and this postseason we know that guys like Duncan Robinson Max Schuess they're shooters even if they go through kind of a a slump they're going to be able to find a way to knock down those open threes and so I really like that as a tactical advantage for the Heat We've talked about the coaching a little bit, and I'd like to put the spotlight on Michael Malone for a little bit here. I think he's a good coach. Um, He's been with Jokic, I think, all eight years Jokic has been in the league. Denver's overachieved, I think. They've done a really great job with their player development, and while in recent years you could maybe view it as underachieving if they have a reigning almost three-time MVP, I think as an organization and as a holistic roster, you know, last year Jokic was the sixth seed, right? He wasn't really expected to go on a huge tear in the playoffs. So I think Mike Malone gets credit for that. That being said, I still think there's levels to coaching and I still think Eric Spolstra is a much better player. You and I have talked, uh, much better coach, sorry. You and I have talked about before. Mike Malone, I think, is getting a little bit of the Mike Budenholzer effect, where he is playing with such a heliocentric offensive player. Jokic makes Mike Malone look like an incredible coach night in and night out. And the Denver roster has given him a lot of credit for being consistent, bringing good messages into the locker room. But I just think that when it comes to game time decisions, running out of timeout plays suppose just a little better and I think he's going to be able to get his players to kind of rally in a way that Mike Malone I think the Nuggets have are running a little high and and the Heat have been so even keel and I like that edge as well for Miami heading into the finals no I think that's a great point what you said of like the matchups are what I think can really catch the Nuggets because like the decision to start Caleb Martin in game seven Wow, did that pay dividends? And again, great coaching decision to start this guy and have the faith in him that he's going to compete at a level that he needs to. And obviously, again, almost winning the um, Eastern Conference Finals MVP, only missing by one vote. Now, I think that was a little inflated, but still, I get the sentiment. This guy, you know, averaging 10 points a game, averages over 20 on 60% per for the whole seven-game series. Now, I think that is where you said that is Miami Heat's biggest thing. Like, if Kevin Love just one game plays, you know, 30 minutes and launches eight threes. How could the Nuggets prepare for that? And I think that's what could rattle Mike Malone. I think that's, if you're the Heat, I'm not saying you're going for like off the wall tactics because you're the lesser roster, but you know, it's almost like when you're an underdog and you know, you go for an onside kick at the beginning of a football game just to see if the other team is ready for it, right? I'm not saying the Heat do that, but I'm just saying maybe the first play is drawn up for drawn up for Caleb Martin and not Jimmy, right? Something like that. Or Tyler Hero, a guy who literally is coming back from an injury. Um, obviously, we don't know when he's going to be back. But I think that's what the Heat will have to do to win this is almost a little trickery as if play you are an underdog. And I know, you know they don't really want that mentality, right? Jimmy Butler saying when they were trying to hand him the Eastern Conference Finals trophy, he said, hand me the next one, right? Referring to the Larry O'Brien. Again, great mentality. And I think I I respect him a lot for that. But I really just think if you're the Heat, you have to come out here and be a little more unorthodox than usual because Nuggets are sound. Like I said, they have have the best player on the court and are the deeper roster, in my opinion. So if you're the Heat, you have to come into this, I think, like an underdog, having playing like it's nothing to lose and trying whatever works, right? Starting Caleb Martin worked. They were running their offense through him a little bit by the end there, right? Jimmy Butler would drive and then they'd be doing some off-ball movement to try to get him open. Keep with that if that's what's working. You know, no team is going to game plan for Caleb Martin. And if they do, that is very interesting, right? So that's what I think. And I think that's your point is great about that, right? Is if the Heat do win, this is their advantage they have. Um, And I think you're 100% right. 
So now as we look towards this first game matchup, right? The finals kick off June 1st, Thursday night. We run into this rust versus rest argument. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts here. To me, I've always believed that there's no, there's no downside to rest, right? No team, I think, would ever choose having a shorter layoff in order to have less rust. I think players are always going to opt for rest. You know, everyone's banged up at this point in the season. Get your bodies right. Get your minds right. Just step away from the game of basketball for a little bit, right? You get so caught up in the emotions of playing these really intense, high-pressure games. And so I don't think that Denver's going to come into this game at a huge rust disadvantage, right? Like the rest, I think, still outweighs the rust. That being said, I do think Miami is in a better basketball rhythm. And Miami, this postseason, has won the first game of each of their playoff series on the road. And that's been in a large part aiding them in this kind of historic eight seed run. And so I'm really curious to see what you think here. I think if Miami's going to win the series, they have to steal one on the road. Denver is such a hard place to play in with the altitude advantage, the home crowd advantage, and just the travel. Miami to Denver is no joke. So I think if Miami gets one, game one's the game that I really want them to get. But I'm really curious where you sit with rest versus rust versus rest, excuse me, and kind of your feelings going into game one. Yeah, so I have a few thoughts on this, but the first thing is, like I said, I, I kind of agree with your take with the Mike Boldenholzer effect where, you know, Mike Malone kind of seems more like he benefits from what he has rather than, you know, it's like this Eric Spolster type, half your roster's undrafted, right? Um, so I think if they win one in Denver, that could rattle him and make this a quick series for the Heat. But if the Nuggets do what I think they're going to do and win both at home, um, like you said, that altitude, that's a pain in the neck in its own right. And in the NFL, I think there's a little more merit to not resting players. Um, the I only know this because I'm a Colts fan, but the only two years the Colts made the Super Bowl with Peyton Manning was years when he played all 16 games. And I think in the NFL, there's way more of an argument for, well, rest is good, but you still need to stay sharp. In the NBA, I just... Don't know if that argument exists as much. Let's look at Kawhi Leonard. The dude barely plays in the regular season. Then come the final time, he's one of the best players in the league. So same thing with Jimmy Butler. He really just coasts through the regular season as we're seeing now. But then look, he's ready for the the playoffs. So I don't know if the rest versus rust argument is as strong because I just think there are guys who do it and I, I just think it's a different mindset. And there's a lot more individual effect in the NBA than the NFL. So because of that, I don't think that's nearly as much of an advantage as the altitude. Multiple players have come out, this year included, you know, as Denver's come to this insane run, I feel like we've talked about Denver more than ever. And multiple players have come out and talked about the altitude, and, and you see it in football as well, or any other sport that's ever played in Colorado, uh, in Colorado, in, uh, in Denver. Um, but, so that's, I think, kind of my biggest takeaway is I just think the home field advantage, I don't think the rest versus rust is nearly as prevalent as Denver being a long plane ride and a very high one at that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, you have to like Denver at home. I think, you know, you, you talked about the line. We've talked about the odds. I think everything is in Denver's favor. To me, it's it's really just that question of, is Miami going to be able to carry the momentum? And just knowing how Spo coaches that team, I don't think they're coming off of too high or too low, right? I think Miami's going to be steady. They're not rattled off of that game seven. And so to me, I would just bank on Miami being in a really good basketball rhythm, maybe coming out and just getting hot from three really early on um, and kind of hitting hitting Denver first, right? If, if they get that first punch off, maybe there's a little bit of the shock. You talked about the Mike Malone factor there and just seeing how Denver responds to really their first bit of true adversity, if it were to be so in these NBA finals, because Denver has really coasted on their way to these finals. Um, with that being said, I kind of wanted to talk about some X factors here. Um, to me, I think there's one player that sticks out to me on both sides of the ball. And when we talk about X factors. It's always guys that might have a contribution that aren't necessarily expected to be and aren't really a headliner to the matchup, right? So for me, I'm really avoiding Jokic, Murray, um, Michael Porter Jr., right? These, those are guys that have to play well if Denver's going to win. So on the nugget side of the ball, I think the guy's Aaron Gordon. You kind of talked about the defensive numbers there. Um, he's aided by the Nuggets are 6-0 against the Heat. The Heat haven't beaten the Nuggets since the bubble. And a lot of that has been how good Aaron Gordon has been on Jimmy Butler. And I think there's a lot of reasons for it. Part of the reason is it's a great matchup for Gordon. Butler's not a guy that does it with a bunch of speed. It's more skill, finesse, and strength. And those are traits that Aaron Gordon possesses from a defensive standpoint. Point. So that's a really strong matchup for the Nuggets. I think the question becomes, can Butler overcome it? And who am I to doubt Jimmy Butler? Because he's proven us wrong at every point of, uh, point of the way. For the Heat, I think the player's Duncan Robinson. And he's a guy that we talked about last night. 
had a lot of did not play coaches decisions throughout this regular season, but he's really found his way into this rotation for Spolstra in this postseason. He usually comes in at the end of that first quarter and plays a little bit of that um, second or fourth quarter. And, you know, with Robinson, I think a lot of the times people make it out to be, is he hitting the three? Then he can stay in. If he's not, you got to pull him out. But to me, I think it's more the the chemistry Robinson has had with that team. He was so big in the NBA finals back in 2020. He had the game five heroic effort from Butler. People forget Duncan Robinson was right there with five or six threes. And to me, a lot of my hope in Miami is riding on Duncan Robinson, being able to find a stroke from three and just stay hot throughout this series. He's a guy that's been there before. He's got a great relationship with the core of this Miami team. And I think on paper, maybe it's because he's white. A lot of people don't really associate him with the hard work, gritty, heat, culture, but I think he's still there for a reason. Miami's paying the guy a lot of money, and I don't doubt that another team out there would take on that contract just knowing how good Robinson is as three-point specialist in a league where it's so three-centric. To me, I really like Duncan Robinson as the Heat's X factor, and I like him a little more than I like Aaron Gordon, which is another reason I'm picking Miami. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with the Aaron Gordon for Denver Nuggets. I've already talked him up this podcast. I think he's a really great player. So I, I, I see real eye to eye on that one. But I will say on the Heat side of things, I'm going to lean Kevin Love because of the I've been there before factor. And again, Kevin Love has been almost every player in his career at this point. The star of a bad franchise, a uh, second or third option on an amazing championship caliber franchise, a journeyman to now a veteran on a roster with guys who have been there, a mix of guys who have and haven't. So if anyone has the miles to sort of be able to tell the guys, hey, you know, I've been here. I mean, I have one of the most famous plays in NBA Finals history as of recent years. I know I know, you just can't shy from this moment. You have to embrace it. And I know he doesn't play a ton of minutes, but it's kind of like the Udonis Haslam thing. They keep him on the roster for a reason, just like they keep Kevin Love on there. Not to mention, I think Kevin Love, for being as old as he is, still one of the best passers in the league on outlet passing. And Denver's a great team. You're gonna, Like I said, you're going to have to think of some things. Putting Kevin Love out there just for his passing ability I think is something that's valuable because the way he he can start a break if you can get some points on Denver just make them feel out of it again that's what I said I think you can rattle them more so than you can rattle a team like the Heat look at what the Heat have done like you said all their success almost has been away they only lost one away against the Celtics I mean it's before the collapse so I just look at it like that and I'm like I think a guy like that could really be the key player in this series, not even necessarily for what he does on the court, but sort of the element he brings as a smart veteran who's made a career in this league for literally being whatever his team needed. He's been so many things in the league. Uh, so I really just think, to me, he has a little more value, and I, and I do like Duncan Robinson as a pick. Like you said, the uh, you know coaches' decisions to not to play were very strange, and they did add up quite a few by the end of the year. But at the end of the day, it's like you said. I don't think there. I think there are quite a few teams who would take him with the contract, knowing his lapses on defense due to his just insane clip of three point percentage, uh, three point three pointers. Excuse me. But to me, Kevin Love is the guy. If if you want to talk to someone about winning championships, as great as I think Udonis Haslam is, I don't think he ever was on the same level as Kevin Love on some of these again Cleveland teams that are some of the most memorable finals of the last fifteen years. I love your point about Kevin Love and quietly. Kevin Love, whenever he's been in the playoffs, I think has made it to the finals. So good on Kevin Love for that statistic. Um, you know, I think in, in large part, Spolstra uses Kevin Love the same way Steve Kerr used to use those veteran bigs for the Warriors, where he starts halves for them. And people make a big deal about starting versus closing, how many minutes you actually play throughout the game. I think there's a lot of value in having a veteran that you can start the game with, knowing that they've been there before, and they're just going to have a steady presence throughout the entire game, whether they're getting minutes or not. And that's really the role Kevin Love has provided for the team. He allows Miami to start a little bigger when they close down the stretch with a lot smaller lineups. And it just gives the team a feeling of, you know, doesn't matter what happens in these first six minutes, we're going to be okay. We're just going to play a steady brand of basketball. He spreads the floor for them. He's a veteran voice. And, you know, with his age, he's never been a great defender. He's st obviously not a great one today, but he, he can hold his own for the most part out there, especially when he's playing that four or five position for them. And again, I, I think that's a really quiet, good pick for an X factor for the Miami Heat. Obviously, he didn't play in that game seven, but I do expect him to be in the rotation in the finals. So I really like that one a lot. Yeah, I just don't see how you keep a guy like that off the floor due to his experience. Like you said, 
Um, I think there are certain things in this league that are invaluable, and I think experience is one of them. Um, I mean, again, in all sports, you really can see it. The team that's been there before usually acts like it a lot sooner than the team who hasn't. You know, look at the Sacramento Kings and Warriors series. To me, that was a big one. Great effort by them. But at the end of the day, I was leaning Warriors just due to the fact of they've been there before. They've won it all before. So even though their roster has holes and issues and weird chemistry things, they have the experience and the players who've been caliber to make it there before. Kevin Love is arguably a Hall of Famer. In my eyes, he is. And like I've said, he's played so many different roles on different teams. He can relate to almost everyone on that team. He's been the star. He's been the aging star in a team that's doing nothing. You know, I just listed him, but I just think what he brings in experience is so valuable, especially in a series where Miami Heat have fought for everything they've gotten. Making it from the play-in, it would just be such a story, and I think Kevin Love can just kind of be the, like you said, the calming force, right, to remind the guys, look, don't play like we're the eight seed, right? Let's just act like we belong here, Um, which I know is a little bit uh, conflicting with my point earlier of playing like an underdog, but the sentiment of just staying calm uh, is more of what I was trying to get at with that rather than how I think they should play. Most definitely. So as we start to wrap up this pod, you have an official pick with the number of games. I I know you're, I I would assume you're going with the Nuggets here. For me, I want to say Heat and seven. I think, I think Miami gets one on the road in the first two. I think Denver gets one on the road in games three and four. And then I think uh, home team wins five and six. Miami closes out in seven. Obviously, I'm sure I'm not going to go pick all seven games right there. But my pick is Heat and seven. Yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, I This is just kind of what when I was doing my research today, kind of what I came to. And I don't like it. Um, I do not like the Nuggets. I think I've been on record multiple times. But I do have Nuggets in five. I have them winning both. In Denver, and then I have, um, let's see, I have Denver, both in Denver, uh, one in Miami, losing the second one, uh, and then winning a close one in Game Five back in. In five, that yeah. I wasn't expecting that. I yeah, I would have thought you would have given would, would have given the Heat a sixth game, but. Um, See, I gave Milwaukee like 30. You know, yeah, I said sure. they would win in four, so I just don't know what I'm talking about, obviously. No, that, so <laughs> thought I'd try something true. different. That's so. true. Well, I guess we'll see um, who's proven right over the next couple of weeks. I think you and I are planning to cover some of these finals games, so we'll do that B-side breakdown we've been doing recently on hopefully a lot of these games. We'll see what the schedule allows for. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate all the support. Please leave a like, comment, or subscribe. Give us any feedback. You know, Drake and I are really excited to kind of close out this first NBA season on the pod, and we have a lot of exciting off-season projects that we're going to be working on. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you at the finals. <laughs>